Yeah, thanks to everybody. I only have a small strip over here at the moment when I'm sharing, but uh, I saw so many people. So thank you for taking your time during your day to listen in uh, and be interested. I'm going to kind of rip through a little bit of history, career history, just for people who don't know me and sort of show some highlights. And then, uh, and then I'll talk about Complex City, which is the project that we're launching in a week from yesterday uh, on Art World, uh, and and some of the particulars. And then we'll have some time for some questions and discussion with Josh. So uh, also feel free to drop your questions in to chat or, uh, yeah, take your mic off and ask if I'm going. If I'm going too fast, Josh, stop me. Keep me in check. Uh, so. Uh, 19 mid 1980s i started uh, loving code and uh, i started writing uh, software drawing tools and these were some of the lines that i was getting i wanted to make uh, drawing tools and use software to enhance my drawing at that time i i was the kind of person that didn't draw very well uh so i thought uh, i hadn't practiced drawing was really the case but i wanted to use a computer which were brand new in the 80s to uh to uh supplement what I saw as a deficiency in my drawing by being able to throw down a bunch of lines quickly and make a bunch of marks and speed things up and automate things, things computers are good at doing. And so I was creating kind of crazy lines, but I still didn't quite know uh, how that applied to art and drawing until I found this guy, Paul Clay, uh, and a book he wrote called The Pedagogical Sketchbook, where he uh, spends a lot of time here and in his notebooks uh, setting down rules for how drawing should be done and so you can see that uh, there's a line moving, it uses a lot of arrows, makes a square, this line pivoting, makes a circle. Well, if you take this pivoting line and you put about three or four of them on a stack and you drag them along, you get those marks at the bottom. So I saw, oh, okay, Paul Clay, who didn't have the, as fluid a medium as computer graphics, still understood the dynamics of drawing. And so I found at that time, art history was a great place to mine through and find people that had systematic approaches to art making that were uh, easily converted to software, easily converted to code. So uh, uh, this is one of the more complex drawings. And I spent a lot of years making complex drawings and uh, converting them into pen plotter drawings on paper and trying to make fine art out of them. Uh, and that sort of reached a dead end, but I'll show you where the where it took off because the dynamics of the of the drawing tools and the dynamics of software are really really interesting. And 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 it was wasn't until I was able to uh, publish them as software that people really got that. But in the meantime, still mining art history, uh, I found another guy from the 1960s uh, in what was called the conceptual art movement, which was a great movement if you're interested in rulemaking and and really algorithmic art at its real core. Saul Lewitt uh, made a diagram where he showed the four basic kinds of line, vertical, horizontal, and diagonal, and then made a system to make all the combinations of them. And they're including the originals, 15 combinations of four types of lines. Uh, and and uh, at that time, of course, in the 60s, when he did it, there was a lot of system systemization going on and IBM was becoming big and computers were just starting out. And so people were really interested in process and process art. And I just saw a way in the 1990s to extend that with software and to work way beyond the bounds of just four parameters because computers could do, you know, tons of iterations. Computers could way, way iterate. So between the drawing tools, which showed me all different kinds of lines and all kinds of variation, and Saul Lewitt, who showed me how to systematize it, I thought, why don't I try to figure out how many different types of drawing tools there were? I tried to system, systematize it. Uh, and that was too big a project. So I settled on a smaller project which was to take a small grid, which is 32 pixels by 32 pixels and all black and white, which is the size of the original Macintosh desktop icon, and to write a program, since I'm a programmer, to uh, go through and count through and show all the variations. Because at this size, and of course the one on the left here is in a program called ResEdit, and this was the icon, this eye shape was the icon that was used in the uh, beta testing version of Photoshop. And so we can all kind of see an eye there and we see a phone and we see a folder and a disc and we remember all these kind of nostalgically, the trash can. Could we write a program that would go through and manipulate that 32 by 32 grid 
and show us all the possible variations of it. And that's what this program does. If you go to uh, numeral.com, every icon, which shows at the bottom, it'll be running. And it just starts with a blank grid. It turns the first pixel black and then the second pixel black and the first pixel white. And it goes through and it counts up all of the variations. And so at some point when it scrolls through all of the possibilities, you should see the trash can and the folder. They should all be in this set. And they are. And when I first wrote it, I started it. It was the evening. I went to bed. I thought I'll get up. I'll start to see a bunch of pictures. And I would use the power of software to generate this whole catalog of pictures. Well, it turns out that in this um, um, size grid and in black and white at about 100 different icons per second, it takes about three months to show you all of the first line, all the variations of the first line. And to show you all the variations of the first two lines takes about 500 million years. So that that was a that was a setback <laughs> in some ways, but it was also an, an eye opener. You know, uh, was there someone? Come on, no. I I, re I realized that no matter how no matter how much brute force, no matter how much computing power I brought to it there would always be a need for a person. There would always be a need for a creative mind, an artist, someone who could decide this is an interesting image, this is not an interesting image. There were so many possible images in a very tiny grid, only in black and white, that in my lifetime, in the life of the universe, would never ever be seen. That was a, it was kind of a, a, a inflection point. And you know, upon that inflection point, lots and lots of software was built because I realized I'm not going to be able to write a piece of software that's going to do it all. I'll have to intervene. And so my personal choices of color and subject matter and meaning and cultural references and all those things were important and came into play. And so uh, all of the works, and you'll see the work today, uh, Complex City is really an autobiography. I realized that I can write software as a personal statement, because all these choices have to be made out of all the possibilities. But just to finish up with every icon, it got very popular. I sold it in a way like NFTs. People paid me $20 when I met them at art openings. I registered them on, on a, um, a public ledger that I kept on my website. They were charged a royalty if they tried to trade them, but it was all very local to me. There was no NFT at that time. And, but it got very popular and what it had to say about digital imaging got very popular and it made it into the Whitney Biennial and it made show after show. Every icon is a little star on its own and it gets shown pretty much every year. Uh, and that was, that was it for about 20 years of every icon uh, until about two years ago when NFTs got very popular and I realized it may be really interesting to take the code which is just sitting on my hard drive and put it on the blockchain and case it on the blockchain and I dropped an NFT uh, in December of 2021 of every icon. Uh, and some of the changes I made, besides starting everyone on a blank grid, I decided to start everyone in their own spot and I decided to let them choose their own spot. So this is one of the sort of starting places you could get. I started mixing things, I started mixing icons and it ended up on OpenSea and you can still find it on OpenSea and still trade them. And these are some of the various mixes they get and the end of that was that one of my original Every Icon collectors from 1997 bought the NFT, got very into the idea of the extension of Every Icon, and it ended up at the Pompidou, where it'll be up until January if you manage to make it to Paris over Christmas. Go see it here with the crypto punks and others. So you never know when you launch a project as an idea in your apartment uh, late at night. Uh, w what life it will have and where it will grow to. So that I, I could talk about every icon for the whole hour, but I won't. But that's that was a well-known project. Uh, in 2011, I got a call that uh, that uh, they were looking for an artist uh, who did digital work, uh, who had some geology background, and who could uh, code an iPhone or iPad app and be done in three months. So I got the job. It was a very short list, uh, and it turned out to be the uh, app album of Bjork, who uh, this was the beginning of the App Store and, and iTunes Store, and Bjork wanted to have a music album where every track was an app, an iPad app that you could play as an instrument. And uh, I got the one called Mutual Core. This is a kind of a well-known uh, uh, album. It was the first app album. I think it might have been the only app album as well, besides being the first. 
And these were layers of the earth because I had a geology background and it kind of functioned as an accordion and you could play it. It became an instrument. And uh, again, that sat from uh, 2012 till last year when it showed up in the permanent collection of the MoMA, they had acquired the source code. So also be careful to write your source code you know, as nicely as possible and comment it well, because you never know if it's going to be, you know, on display in some public institution some years down the line. Okay, so I talked about the pen plotter drawings. And one of the problems with taking pen plotter drawings to Soho and trying to sell them in the art market of uh, the late 90s was that the paintings that were original works on canvas and big and colorful had the kind of top notch uh, in the in the market and works that were infinitely repeatable and black and white on paper, you know, occupied a kind of a lower rung. Uh, so, so the uh, pen plotter drawings were not uh, hugely marketable. The other problem was, and the real problem was that the pen plotter drawings didn't really show what was happening. They didn't really show the dynamics of the software. That was, I was taking the software, making a drawing with it, and then putting it statically on paper. I needed a way to, get out the dynamics of the creativity of what the software was doing. And that's when I came up with what I call my art appliance. And you can see on the left, uh, there's a uh, Apple 280C, which was the first color Apple laptop that's been uh, completely stripped of its casing. Uh, the electronics are displayed up front and it shows a, a piece of software. And this is how I turned it around and took the software from behind the scenes and put it right out front, literally on front of this plastic panel. Uh, and I was able to take some rules, again, looking in art history for rules. I took the rules of color theory that were expressed by Joseph Albers and Johannes Itten, uh, two other Bauhaus artists, and made them dynamic on the screen. So we had color studies, but instead of being silk screens, they were dynamically changing, constantly changing. And this piece was immediately popular ended up in several institutions and was shown in the program show at the Whitney of 2018, when it was kind of a look back at software, early software art. Uh, but for me, it was a way of actually getting software out there. And it turned out that in that same hierarchy, that same financial hierarchy, uh, electronics, which were very expensive then still, uh, and uh, a sculptural object, unique sculptural object turned out to be actually a very good thing to sell. People could collect it. And so we saw lots of these uh, screens. And this uh, work evolved over time uh, to be uh, these large cabinets and see are some laser cut and CNC elements. And then on the lower right is a screen. And I spent about 10 years uh, building works uh, of, of scale. You can see three of us uh, in the upper right here trying to install the piece. I spent uh, about 10 years trying to make a series of works which were like painting-like works that had screens in them. That was sort of the sort of the uh, objective to move forward. And all this in some ways was because there was not really a very good way to uh, encapsulate and sell a piece of software just on its own. Like people are not, we're not used to paying much for software. Uh, and also there's not a, a great way uh, to uh, signify ownership of software until, uh, uh, blockchain and tokens came along and then the ideas changed like all of a sudden I didn't have to think about cabinetry I didn't have to think about repairing screens or upgrading software this all could be uh, encapsulated into this token and people could own that and also the idea of uh, ownership of a digital thing which was kind of unthinkable uh, originally uh, uh, because it was just maybe you had it on your uh, PC and your PC crashed and you lost the thing now it's in a public place and you can claim it uh, this idea of ownership of a digital thing, it really changed the market. And so I went back first to every icon. And then this year, uh, with the help of, of Art World, I went back to a project that was launched in 2000. And it was similarly uh, a G3 Wall Street laptop uh, that was uh, the case taken off, the screen put on the front, the guts put on the back, and the piece of software ran. And it was shown as an array of 12 screens uh, uh, up on the wall. Uh, and so uh, I went back and revisited this software. I took it from C language and Apple toolbox graphics into uh, P5JS and JavaScript uh, and got all the little parts running independently. Some of it with the help of ChatGPT, some of it with just porting it over myself, lots of experimentation. Uh, 
uh, and I managed to uh, get it running. So I will show you, let me stop this for a second and I'll show you the piece. Uh, here we go. There we go. Okay, so there it is running. And that's the composition, similar composition. What you what you saw before was the original screen. And I did my best in what I call the classic composition to reproduce the digital screen, the original screen. And I'll talk about the uh, components of it. So uh, on the lower left was, uh, was um, the traffic. And I was inspired a little bit by um, Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie, which is kind of kind of refers to in its color schemes of the cars and and that. Also, a film called Koinosatsky, which was a time lapse film, which showed uh, the rhythms of traffic moving in New York City. And I wanted to kind of show that software was about change and rhythm and movement, and I wanted to capture that rhythm. Uh, yeah, Mondrian, but also in the flat colors and flat shapes are very attractive to a computer programmer of the year 2000 because it's they're easier to move around and they don't cost a lot. Now, now you have you can do great 3D and transparency, but I stuck with that kind of aesthetic from the original piece, these kind of flat shapes and colors. Uh, so that's the traffic is moving. You have a traffic simulation because traffic is a, if you ever walk around New York City, yeah, it's dealing with traffic, especially if you try to drive in the city or even drive to the city. Uh, which is my chore now. Anyway, on the uh, right side, uh, moving up and down uh, are some elevators. They go up, they deposit colors into the grid. Uh, they move down, they get random calls for floors to go to. They get random pallets uh, to fill it, fill it up with. Uh, and this was, besides being a kind of a uh, visual time-based description of my life, going from home to studio and back again, up and down elevators everywhere, uh, it was also uh, an idea of how do we make a system like every icon that's going to fill up a grid and make a picture in an automated way and see what the results are. And so instead of starting in the upper left and counting forward, I made a set of elevators to draw a picture with. So ne next to the elevators to the left is a maze uh, that's constantly drawing and solving itself, which is a metaphor for us, our daily work kind of having a to-do list and going through all the sets of decisions and coming to a conclusion and then getting another set of decisions. But it's also, if you've ever run around doing errands in the city on foot, getting on the subway, going up and down buildings, going to different department stores, going to all, the, all everywhere you shop, going to museums, galleries, okay, you're running around this little maze. So it was also that. It was also a person's day in the city. Uh, and then on the left, uh, I call them the shutters. They open and close like uh, Venetian blinds that you see in lots of windows. But also, it's uh, if you uh, spend time in the city during the day, the sun travels across the faces of the buildings and changes colors of the building. So it was a kind of a nice, simple way to express uh, another change of time. Uh, you see in the upper middle, uh, there's some tall buildings that are stylized after Stuart Davis's uh, New York mural. Uh, and the sky right now is black and the cars at the bottom are making streaks. And so it's nighttime and every uh, two minutes uh, it'll change from day to night. So you'll notice the uh, sky start to get blue again. In the original piece, it was four minutes, but in the 2023 piece, uh, like shorter attention spans, I guess I made it two minutes long. Uh, and in the center is this uh, computer chip, which it's kind of like part of the tapestry of the piece. It's part of the composition of the piece. But also it's uh, it's anomalous. And in 2000, there was still a lot of discussion. Oh, you can see the sky getting lighter now. In 2000, there was a lot of discussion about machine control. It was not a foregone conclusion that chips would be in our doorbells and our refrigerators and everywhere in our lives, that chips would uh, infiltrate everywhere. People were still weary about machine control. Uh, and so uh, I thought that the chip would be there kind of in the midst of it, controlling it. Uh, it's part of the story, but also uh, it's a piece of software. So, okay, the chip is there anyway behind the scenes. There's chips there running it anyway, but it needed a chip to function. And this chip is a was called an EEPROM chip, which was a, a kind of an in innovation where there was a little window at the top and you could program it like a read-only memory, but then you could use a light and erase it. Now all that's done completely electronically. But at that time, it was a, it was a, I love the design of having a chip with a window at the top. So you're looking into the computing going on in the center. Uh, oh, if you see in the middle, I don't know if the resolution is good enough through Zoom, but in the middle of the uh, 
buildings now. There's a flock of birds that go around. There is a flock of birds that live there, which was the birds that lived uh, behind my studio on 35th Street that would uh, on the brownstone roof that would often fly around. So I, I tried to make the writing of the software like uh, like writing a story besides the functionality and what the functionality said. I tried to I tried to make the code and the way it uh, the timing and the rhythms and the and the arrangements of it. I tried to make that code be a kind of writing, kind of a creative writing. So instead of using code to solve a problem or automate a process to try to use the language of C language in that case and JavaScript in this case to be, yeah, the, the storytelling language. So in the bottom right is called the accumulator. And that's similar to every icon. If you bought an every icon on a certain date, it would start to uh, accumulate. Uh, and it would and every time you turned on your every icon, it would show you from the beginning to the present time how far every icon had come. And I built that into the original complex city in something I called the accumulator. So you see the very center box there on the lower right. Uh, when it hits an end wall and turns around, the box in the rectangle immediately outside of it moves once. And when that makes a circuit, the box on the outside of that moves once. And when that makes a circuit, the next one moves. Uh, and so it, it it's it's a feature of software art that you don't find in video art because video art uh, will uh, make a loop and repeat. Software art can can have memory and can compute in real time, which is what's happening in all the colors and everything you see. And so this uh, uh, accumulator is set for November 9th uh, when the piece goes live. So when we start to sell copies of the NFT on November 9th, it'll start to accumulate. And anytime you open it up in the uh, months and years ahead, the boxes on the left, which are gray now, will start to activate and become purple and start to move as you uh, gather more and more time, as you accumulate more and more time. And uh, to fill this one up, uh, depending on, a little bit on the speed of your computer, should take somewhere between 500 and 1,000 years. So you have you have a, a lot of time to enjoy before that thing totally fills up. Uh, and that's, that's the same one to bring in the same sentiment that we can compute on extraordinary durations that are way, way outside of our own, you know, experience and reflect on that somewhere in this. And that's a that's definitely a feature of software art. So yeah, it's just all you see the accumulation is just since I turned it on today, but November 9th it'll start. Okay. So that was kind of the layout of the original complex city. Not this color scheme, but uh, but um, something very similar that you saw on the slide. Uh, but um when I designed that piece of software, it was designed to be sold to individuals on their own screens that sat in their living rooms or in their homes and enjoyed by that by that small group over a long period of time. And people have owned those pieces since 2000. So I have collectors that have had them in their house and have run them, some of them never turning them off for you know, 20, 23 years so far uh, and enjoying them that way. But the way I thought about the software at that time was uh, a depth was duration. I thought, how can I make this change? That's one reason I use the night day cycle and the accumulate. I want I want people to see change like the elevators accumulating over a long period of time and watch that change and enjoy it. Web three comes and it's not about depth anymore. It's about breadth. It's about having uh, additioning lots of copies with variation because uh, the rules of additioning kind of loosened up over the years. It's about the breadth and it's about sites that can aggregate and accumulate uh, all of the published tokens and and put them all on display at once. So when you get to OpenSea, uh, you're not you're not experiencing one particular token or your own token individually in your own screen. You're seeing you can see everybody's and you can put them all uh, side by side. So how do I design a piece that uh, keeps the structure of the original? Uh, uh, and the integrity of the original complex city without, uh, uh, you know, sacrificing that, but still give a lot of variation. So when people get, get their own drop, it's going to be unique. It's going to be different than everybody else's. Uh, and so, sorry about this dinging, if you can hear it. People are have decided to text me all at once. <laughs> Nobody's experienced that before. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so how do we make it different? How do we make it similar enough that we know it's complex city, but different enough that everybody has their own unique piece? And also for, a, for an artist, now I have a faster machine. I can move more things around. I can find more variation. What do I want to explore? What are my explorations like? Uh, so, yikes. Give me one second. I'm getting rid of these. 
Okay, hopefully that's quite right. So how do I explore the piece? Okay, so in writing it, I had to write each individual module uh, as its own separate program because Artblocks, who, uh, who is the contract we're publishing under, uh, how uh, they, they require that this piece be scalable. And so I had to make each little part not be spoke to the G3, 1024, 768 screen, but how do I make it so that it scales and moves around? And in doing so, I had nine separate programs to play with. So you'll see how that went. So this is the classic composition and there are six different compositions and there'll be 512 uh, uh, tokens dropped and we'll, we'll divide the piece amongst, sort of equally amongst all those. Uh, so there's the classic, this one I call the Chelsea composition. So I've taken the same modules. These are our same traffic and elevators and maze and our same familiar modules, but I've rearranged them by subdividing the space into rectangles. Oh, I forgot to mention that each of the each of the scenes that I'm showing has its own interactivity. So besides getting your own composition, each one will have uh, a way to interact with it by clicking on it. In the Chelsea module, you get to explore the space subdivision, which basically means you get to explore all the compositions. So right now I'm clicking through so you'll when your when your token drops, you'll have your sort of original composition, and that's mine. You'll know that composition; that'll be your unique thing. But you will be able to look through all the variations of it, so you'll be able to see lots and lots of changes. And if you have it on display somewhere on a on a screen where you have the ability to either touch the screen or use a mouse or some remote control to touch it, you'll be able to change the composition yourself day to day. So that's the Chelsea variation. Chelsea variation is kind of wild but still within its boxes. So that's the, uh, for me, that's the art world there. It's like out there, but still it's business. Okay, so then I thought besides recomposing by space subdivision, why don't I give some solos to each individual and really explore each individual module? So here's the traffic module now takes over three quarters. Instead of the lower left, the traffic module becomes the star and the maze and the shutters and buildings are kind of at the top. And now they start to mix and the elevators and the traffic modules start to overlap and we start to see the boundaries that were keeping the original composition, you know, a little more in check. Uh, and uh, the interaction here is that there's a certain number of cars when you start and that's true for every module, but on the traffic module, if you click on the right hand side, you get to add cars. And so you see, I just added and I added more and I can add more and you can have some uh, fun and interest uh, building up the level of cars and creating, you can create a huge traffic jam if you want. Uh, and so you see, they start to jam up and you can control the traffic. And if you click on the left-hand side, although a little more slowly, it'll remove cars and you can get them down to where there's like, I think 10 or 15 cars left. So it's like middle of the night, like two in the morning and you can see it and the cars run really fast and here they run really slowly. So you get to play with the traffic a little bit. Okay, the next variation is the elevators. And uh, they're separate in, in this particular module, when you click, you can, you can change the elevator palette so you can switch through and also the width of the elevator shaft. So there's a lot here, there's some wider ones here, there are fewer of them. So you can play a little bit with the picture composition. You'll get your original one and then you'll have the ability to, to click if, if you're in the elevator module. So the elevators are the star here. And then in this one, the buildings are the star and they take up most of the space. And the interaction here is that you can click on the buildings uh, and you can uh, create different skylines. So yeah, you'll have your startup, which will always be the same. And then you'll be able to look through a variety of skylines and kind of play with it. So a little, little bit of variety there. And the final one I, I call the village, uh, which is like in Greenwich Village is the place in the city where they're not, the streets aren't in grids anymore. Everything is kind of hodgepodge and the boundaries are kind of dissolved there. Uh, and so that when uh, this is the village and you basically get a kind of a, a computer art glitch aesthetic going on, everything is overlaid. And the, and the um, interaction here is you get your original one, but you're able to click through lots of variations. You're able to look at the lots of overlays. So the glitchy ones I think will be really popular. And that's sort of the, the if I have to tell the story from the very straight lace, uh, very art world, traditional editioned, version of Complex City that took place in 2000 to the uh, open public blockchain crypto backed NFT version of Complex City is that it's kind of a boundary dissolution. Uh, Complex City opened up, it went open source on the chain uh, and the modules kind of uh, uh, went went out on their own. So that's, that's a kind of a speed rundown <laughs> of uh, what's happening and uh, 
Josh, how are we doing? And we're doing we're doing well. All right. Wait, should we should we start with some questions then? Okay, sure. Into, or, are we going back into the or is there more art that you wanted to show from? No, I think that's that's a good summary. I think let's just get a little feedback and yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so anybody have any questions they want to pose put in the Q and A? Um, so one one question that that came up, uh, Graham Smith asked, Graham, do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it for you? Okay, I'll ask for you. Um, has Complex City always been a, uh, interactive? Was was the original version interactive, or is that new to, the, to this project? Yeah, good. Is that Graham? Hi, Graham. I know Graham for a long time. <laughs> good, yeah. Happy you're here. I think Graham. Yeah, Graham was around for that every icon drop and. Uh, and uh, yeah, so no, n none of the screens up until 2018 were ever interactive. And I did a piece called Blossoming in 2018. That was the first one I did that was a touch screen, kind of because touch screens were uh, bulky and cumbersome uh, for a long time. And uh, I thought about doing an iPad uh, thing that was a little tricky uh, software wise. So yeah, so uh, I did Complex City. I mean, I did every icon. Every icon had an interactive element in the beginning. You, when you bought every icon NFT, you got a token, a blank token, and you went to the uh, Eatworks website and you got to click through variations and choose. I thought that was an interesting dynamic because everybody was doing these drops where you got a generative piece, but you were kind of assigned your parameters. And I wanted to have a generative piece where you got to kind of pick have a little uh, choice in it. That's why I put the interactivity into this. I think that that's a great component of software work that doesn't appear in video work. And I always want to show that it's software art and I want to uh, I want to enhance or or show the strengths of that kind of work and what it's what it's uh, uh, essential, what's essentially unique about software art. I want to kind of try to bring to the front in the pieces, even if it's not uh, what it's about because uh, yeah, you can accumulate time, you can interact with the work. And so in, in this case, I wanted, uh, so maybe you get a dr generative drop and you're, you like it, but you're not 100% thrilled with it. Okay, you can click on this and get some variation. I thought that was a, a fun feature. So thanks for cool. that. Um, hey, John, you know, by the way, I think we might want to, is the program still running on your computer? Yeah. We might want to pull it back up. It, yeah, no, 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 I oh. think actually it might, we might want to close it. I think it's actually just lagging the audio a little bit. <laughs> uh. Very cool. Um, actually, Graham, did you want me to ask your follow-up question? Okay, there we go. Um, how do you feel conceptually about adding interaction to the work, to, to this particular work? Uh, I think I think it addresses a need. Uh, it also, yeah, why not? Uh, because it's possible. Because when the screens were on the wall, it, it, getting a touch screen was tricky, and and. I had to think a lot about when I sold a screen as an artwork, I had to think a lot about the replacement and touch screens are not always that common and regular screens are more common. And I think over time, I felt like it would be just, a, a be, it might become, things might change in a way that people wouldn't build touch screens anymore or they'd build them differently. So I thought it might be a problem if I locked the interaction to the screen. So that was, but here online, yeah, you got a mouse on your computer, your iPad is, touch sensitive so it seems like a lot less of a problem over time and so yeah it was available to build in also building in interactivity is a lot it can add a lot of work uh and so in the original pieces it was enough usually i think complex city took six months to originally program especially coming up with the ideas and things like that so um here i had the ideas down that was one speed advantage that i had was that i didn't have to redesign the modules i already had code it was more or less porting them and then another speed boost was I got ChatGPT to do a lot of the porting for me and writing some of the code for me. So that was really a great speed up. So I had time to think about the interactivity and to design it. So designing interactivity can add layers and layers to what you have to worry about when you when you make a piece of code. When you add the cars, that was fine to add the cars. I could add the cars, in either, but subtracting the cars that was about a day's work, unfortunately, because you couldn't just pull them out of the middle for various reasons. I, I ended up having to wait until the car got off the edge. That's why it takes longer. The car exits the screen and I can remove it. But if I removed it in the middle, it messed up all of the lane changing and things like that, whereas throwing it down did. So you never know when you add interactivity how much more work you're going to do. So that, that was some of the thought process. 
That's fantastic. Um, there's a question from a uh, young lady. Do you want me to ask the question, Nelly? Uh, I'll ask. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the meditation component of your work. Do you mind talking about your meditation practice? No, Please. not at all. As a matter of fact, I have the book right here. <laughs> What's that? Draw, drawing your own path. <laughs> nice. So I, I, it, there's a there's a close connection between the software and the drawing. That's that's and and the drawing led me into the meditation practice. So I I thought in in uh, 1999 and 2000, right when I was writing these pieces that I could, uh, in the way that I took Paul Clay's rules and Solowitz's rules and made art out of them, I thought that I could understand my own rules for making drawings. I thought I could self-examine deeply and, and make an expert system, which is what it was called then, uh, make an expert system that would make my drawings for me if I could come up with the rules. And so I say it's the wrong question, but the right answer, because I, I did a lot of introspection to try and find the source of my creativity. So take your time and try to discover sitting with a pencil and paper and I'll make a mark and I'll make another mark. And I'll say, well, why when I was doodling, did I go this way? Or why when I was doodling, did I go that way? And try to try to see deeply who who's making that decision? Where's that decision come from? This is the essence of a, of a like a Zen koan that says, who am I? This is a very deep insight meditation, but I didn't know it at the time, but I practiced it daily, which I still do daily drawing. I practiced it daily for, I don't know, six or seven years. And then something started to happen, which is what would happen if you practice insight meditation for a long time. I began to, to see that the self was a kind of a construction of the mind. And then I got very destabilized, like, well, if the self is just this empty thing, what what is there in the world? And so that so I, then I spent a number of years uh, reading and researching through psychology and and neurobiology and religion and trying to figure out what it was I was going through. And I found the best answers in uh, at that time in the Theravada Buddhist tradition with the, what was called the progress of insight path. That's that's where I started and a group called the Buddhist Geeks, of course, because they could understand programmers and they could understand alternate practices. And uh, and through Vincent Horn and Emily Horn and the Buddhist Geeks, I uh, I came to understand that, yes, drawing is a is a meditation practice in the same way you get into flow in lots of things in your life. You can if you use a little bit of insight and a little bit of mindfulness can can uh, can use it as a as a meditation practice. So I, so I draw every day. I have a site called iClock.com and uh, I post on there since 2008. There's something like 5,000. This is the one I was working on this morning. And uh, I write, I write on, uh, I write about it. And um, what it turned out in the beginning in 2000 was that I would do the drawings and then I would say, huh, that would be really interesting to animate as a, as a piece of software. And so a lot of the drawings early on uh, were contributors to the designs of uh, pieces that followed. Uh, there was one called A Life. There was one called Automata Studies. There was one called uh, Window, and they all kind of came out of this uh, what I'd call an improvisational daily drawing practice. Uh, and I think it's super, super healthy, like like flossing your teeth and and going to the gym to find five minutes in your day to just be creative just to let yourself like just do whatever you want to do creatively or just be open to the fact that you could be creative is all, almost enough. Just letting go during the day for a little bit of time is su super healthy and it, it builds a great habit. Uh, the thing I love about drawing as meditation is that um, you get the benefits, all the benefits of meditation and, and you get a drawing <laughs> at the same time. So double bonus there. So yeah, I, I, uh, in 2014, I gave a I gave a talk at a Buddhist Geeks conference, and I got contacted by Parallax Press, who published Thich Nhat Han books, which was a great honor. And they said they were writing a book about mindfulness and finance, and mindfulness and athletics, and we could write a book about mindfulness and drawing. And I did, and uh, and uh, I've kept a drawing your own path, which is the name of the book, as a site, and we do daily meditation practice. So there's a lot behind the scenes there, but yeah. Uh, it benefited the software, you know, as well as it benefited everything else. 
So, uh, I'm, Jen, I'm going to slip into my own question here. Um, so, you you know, you'd mentioned using uh, ChatGPT to uh, to help with some of writing the code, and you know, and I'm sure you're also like watching what's happening with generative AI and you know the and AI's ability to like understand a drawing and understand um, you know artistic intent, which is like kind of different than a way someone would do it in a generative practice. But I, I would be curious in what your perspective is on that. Yeah, first of all, I, I don't know, but from, from where I stand right now and what I see happening around me, we're in some huge moment. Uh, it feels really big. It feels as big as the moment of uh, when the uh, first saw web browsers, but I think it may even be as big as the moment when we saw uh, graphical user interfaces come in, like that profoundly different way of using uh, digital technology to gather and disseminate and understand information. It just It's incredible, and it's happening on the textural, language, visual, it's happening on so many fronts that I think it's gonna be like that chip integration into the world. Like, you know, I've got this little AirPod and pretty soon, uh, uh, no matter what language you're speaking, I'll hear it in mine and you'll uh, hear what I say in your language. It'll be sort of that built in to everything. So that's, that's I just think it's an incredible moment. I think we can't, uh, and I, I see it as kind of like Moore's law happening because one AI trains the next. So I see this kind of doubling going on. And if the last year has kind of borne that out, it's like we've, we've kind of double capability and I think it'll continue. It's, it's, it's amazing. So how does it relate? I think um, what I was trying to do in every icon was to uh, envision the space of possibility of images. I wanted a, I wanted a machine to be kind of like a spaceship through all images. So I wrote every icon and it started at square one, literally, and went forward. But uh, uh, I wanted, uh, uh, if, you, if you jumped ahead in every icon, like my father said, can't you just skip ahead a few billion years? So if you write every icon to just randomly jump into the middle of the space, most times, the very tiny percentage of the time you'll get something meaningful. Most times you'll get noise. What AI did was to gather that space and figure out how to move through it in a more coherent way. So it's in a way, it's an ultimate solution to what I dreamed about 25 years ago with every icon, being able to go to sleep and come up and have a thousand pictures ready. It does that. It does it incredibly and it does it at your prompt and it learns from like everything that's already out there. So so it's it's an incredible opportunity for anyone who doesn't, like the interface, you don't have to know how to program. The interface is very easy to text prompt uh, and get things back. But for, uh, even on a programming level, it's kind of amazing the ways you can automate. And 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 so you can have generative work. There's a, there's a site called mprops that I use and you can put P5JS scripts, you can put JavaScripts below the the uh, generative AI generative engine. And so you can prompt basically with code to do these things. So there's a great combination of generative and AI that's sort of forming now. And, and that'll come into something like a video game where you're moving through a terrain in real time and it's being generated and you're the first person ever to explore it and it's responding to what you've done before. I mean, I think that we haven't even seen what's gonna happen. So very exciting time for sure. Very cool. Uh, and then, John, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about with um, with the Art World project with Comic Book City was that with the, was the the fact that you're doing this on chain and like I, you know, there's right. and like what that means. Can you can you explain a little bit what a, what an actually like an on chain artwork is? Oh, okay. So, Complex City Original. The source code is on my hard drive, hopefully still, or on some backup disk or maybe it's on a backup tape that I can't read anymore. And I and maybe I mail emailed a copy to somebody, but how would you, Josh, get to look at it? Would you get to look at it if I open sourced it? Maybe my website would have to be maintained. Okay. But there is a place, in this case the Ethereum blockchain, that a bunch of people care about and a bunch of people maintain. And so the, the way that Ethereum holds its value is that we have a lot of nodes that are constantly checking with each other and saying, yeah, do our numbers match? Do our numbers match? And they keep everything together. So the beauty of putting it on your code on the blockchain is it becomes part of that verification validation scheme. It becomes available worldwide. You're not maintaining a website. It's being maintained as part of the value of this chain. 
Uh, and so it's not, it's not, so Elon Musk, I guess, very recently was talking about, oh, your JPEG is somewhere else and NFTs will break. But in this case, and Artblocks pointed it out in a reply tweet was that their work is on chain and we're using their contract is that all the code that I've written to run, uh, to run complex city and also every icon is in a block on the blockchain that you can find and you can look at and you can copy and you can take that code and do what you want with it. Or if you own it and it breaks and you need to port it or in the future, someone wants to migrate complex city, it's all there in the JavaScript language. And what I've seen with ChatGPT is not only can it explain to you the JavaScript language, but it can move it to other languages. So I think we have the tools to, to think that putting things on chain is a way of documenting and preserving them in a better way than we've had in the past, for sure. Very cool. Um, oh, I have another question. You know, one of the things that we had actually talked, and does anybody else have a question? David, do you have a question, by the way? I, I saw. Do you want to ask your question? Well, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think you've kind of answered it uh, a bunch of times, but the, it was like, you know, what's next for Complex City with all this interactivity and chat GPT and all the possibilities? Just if you were like thinking, projecting in the future of Complex City reappears or, you know, you go through another um, iteration. Yeah, of that's it. a good question. Wow. I like that. I have thought about it. And there was a there was a kind of a version of the traffic that went around called HD traffic. So there was a 3D traffic version kind of in the 2012 range. So that was one in one vision would be make it 3D. Uh, I, I didn't touch it for 20 years. So so maybe this version will stay. I am looking at I've done so many software pieces that need need to be thought about and have opportunity to upgrade that the next project will be a different piece of software. But yeah. I mean, I mean, I would like to be able to go into the buildings. I'd like to be able to cross section the buildings and see people in their offices and apartments moving around. And and there are, there are some great uh, experiments that have been done with um, AI agents where they kind of interact and have their own lives. It'd be interesting to to have a city where you had some kind of agency going on, and so you'd come you'd come and visit the city, and they would have built different things or torn down different things. If you could, you know, in the sort of a far future projection, yeah, complex city would would itself be a living city in some sort of AI world? So yeah, a lot of ideas, okay. more than I can do. Okay, oh, I just got a, I got a reminder from Cody uh, that this is a link to the, we're, we're selling bundles of these by the way. So, um, and this is actually gonna be available three o'clock Pacific time on Monday. So if you wanna, this is before the, before the, the public drop of the individual works, uh, we're selling bundles of complex city on art world. Um, this is a the interactive portion of future spaces where we have things to sell. This is kind of fun. Um, <laughs> I, I should just say one thing about the bu bundles, just for a second. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so they're those six. Uh, they're the six uh, scenarios: the classic, the Chelsea, the elevators, the buildings, the traffic, and the village. And if you buy the drop on next Thursday, you'll you'll buy them one at a time, and you'll be randomly assigned one of those. Which is which is fine, and you you might get uh you'll definitely get a good one, uh. But um, if you would like to guarantee that you have one of each of all six of them, and you don't have to take chances or try to pick them up on the secondary, you can get the bundle ahead of time, and the uh, so the advantage is you get one of each of the six, and you will get a very low edition number because the because we we'll only have a limited number of bundles, we probably won't sell out of bundles. And if you care about edition numbers, the edition numbers will be sequential in your bundle as well. So those are those are collector features that you might like for the bundle. And I and I should know because of the vagaries of the art blocks engine, we can't accept credit cards. But if you if you're like don't have Ethereum and want to like know how to do it, just like email me and I can help you figure it out. Um, okay, yeah, our, so, art world should be able to help with that. Yes, yes, Sorry. yes. You could do Josh at artworld.com, my, my third email address. And uh, you can, or just find me any, anywhere else. Um, so we have five minutes. Uh, any any other kind of questions, uh, final questions? I have one final question, if not. All right, I want to ask my question. Uh, so John, you know, before before we sort of started the, uh, the talk today, we talked a little bit about, you know, what it means to like display these things physically and sort of like the challenges of creating digital art. Um, I think there's this like connotation that, of like, you know, you have to make things physical. Like, a, like an art is like a painting or a sculpture. And like, you know, obviously you were using laser cuts and plotters and CNCs, you know, to, to you know, and, you know, deconstruct it, you know, um, you know, art appliances. Like, like, 
Right. Was that a stopgap until we had digital scarcity or like, you know, how do you think about that? Uh, it's, it's not a, it wasn't a stopgap. I mean, I think that's a great contrast. There are things that, that a physical, there's things about art that aren't covered by the screen. Like uh, the, the presence of an object, you know, the craftsmanship of an object, the physical textural, the response of large fields of color. There are a lot of things that, that the screen can't do. And I think what I was trying to do in combining them was to try to get a little bit of the best of both. And there are things, of course, that you can do distribu distribution worldwide and multiple copies and interactivity on screens that you can't. So, so uh, it's going to stem from what I want to say and what the ideas are and what I need to express, where the best way to put it out is. But the screens are getting better. The software options are getting better. The manufacturing techniques are outrageously good now, the way you can... 3D print and fabricate with different materials and the kind of surfaces and the kinds of big screens. You saw that Rafik at the moment, that huge screen, the beautiful yes. textures of screens and and the filters. So that's all getting great. So I, I, I just think, you know, again, it's going to depend like you sit in a studio, I sit with the pencil and paper, I watch what arises and and that moves my energy forward and I base my work based on what comes forward from that and, that, and whatever that is bet however that's best expressed i'm going to do so I, I wouldn't say one is better or whatever what, what the material is appropriate to the message is going to be the one that wins out and that works well so and i got my eyes open everywhere i love it thanks so much that's a that, that's a fantastic an answer and, and a fantastic place to leave it um thank you so much john for being with us today this is super super interesting a great way to end the week um everybody will have uh we have the drop next week uh at artworld.com ARTWRLD.com. Check it out. Um, and uh, yeah, we also have uh, many future spaces webinars coming up. I got some uh, videos coming online. So check us out. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, great to see everyone. Thanks again. We'll uh, see you at another future spaces. Yeah.